Welcome everybody as we're getting started here. Um, we'll give it a couple minutes, people wrapping up their previous calls, bio breaks, topping off that coffee. You've got a couple minutes if you are, if you need to do one of those things, huh? but we'll, we'll get started here just a couple past the hour. Um, were you at the, uh, at the Husky football game on? Yes. And I will tell you that um, I am getting very nervous about the national attention the Huskies are getting. Like this is rarefied air. Like we've been ranked many times in my, you know, adult life, but like you got Herb Street saying they could, they, they could be a number one. You got the athletic talking about them as, as potentially the most exciting team in football, which makes me nervous because we're going into Arizona this weekend. And that is not, that's a Hornets. It usually doesn't go reason. well. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll see how that one shakes out here. Um, we're talking about the Washington, University of Washington Huskies football team here. Matt and I both have tickets to to them. Uh, we'll get started here in just a minute um, as as we go through that. If you're coming in, you got time for bio break, a coffee, but uh, I'd also those love to know. I mean, just in the chat, just let us know yeah. who you are, where you're from. I got Harry wrote, wrote, rooting for the oh, we got, we got Ohio the, State the, University. Yeah. There was a great. One of the one of my favorite signs from game day last week, uh, Harry, was someone because they did it from South Bend for the Notre Dame Ohio State game. Someone had a sign up that said "An Ohio State University," which I thought was a nice little subtle. <laughs> That's yeah. Michigan. Oh, now so we got Ohio uh, State right, Michigan right underneath it. We're gonna have a fight. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a stick fight right at the beginning of this. <laughs> Who else y'all rooting for? Where are you in the country? If you don't have a team, where are you? Uh, it's just as we're waiting, giving people a sec to, to get in here. Matt and I are both located up in the Northwest here. University of Florida coming in there. All right. All right. It's amazing just how irrational sometimes the, the college sports allegiances are. Right. Like I grew up in California. I came up here and became a Husky and, um, you know, assumed Washington State was going to be the big rival. But no, it's really Oregon. Um, it's the, sort of the, the main villain up here. And uh, I, it's, I won't spend money in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, it's a totally irrational thing, but in my mind, it makes a total sense. Just cannot support highlighter yellow as a uh, color palette. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I'm excited, Justin, to see uh, Texas doing well. Steve Sarkeesian was our coach for a while, was not a good time in his life, and seems to have kind of cleaned some stuff up and doing real well. So um, I'm, I will root for the Longhorns. Hook them. <laughs> all right well we're three pass and i know you all are uh, as much as it's fun to talk about football and all of these fun things we are here to learn from one of my favorite people um first off uh, my name is chef marku i'm the cmo here at bombora um i've had the privilege of working with matt before uh this is matt hines from hines marketing founder ceo uh general great all-around good guy and great thought leader if you're not following and make sure you do um, we had a chance to to talk uh, a little while back at our intent event about just the future trends um, that are top of mind for B2B. And we realized that, that there's a lot going on. There's a lot on the horizon. Um, and we really shouldn't limit that to to our audience at the intent event. And so we, we have the honor of having Matt back to talk again. And I hope you all will, I know you all will take away incredible insights from it, just as I have um, going through that. Um, he's even updated it with even some of the newer trends and things like that. It, it, it happened just the last couple, you know, call it 60, 90 days type thing um, since we held our intent event. So excited to dive in on that. Uh, ask your questions. We've got the chat open. Um, you can drop them in Q&A. We'll circle, he might hit on a couple of them as we're going, but we'll, we'll definitely circle around to them at the end of the talk here. Um, but with that, you aren't here to hear me. I might make comments a little bit throughout this. Um, there might be a couple polls that pop up as we go through this here. Um, and so watch out for those, but with that, Matt, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm going to set up my screen here so I can see the chat as well and see what y'all are talking about as we go on. Uh, but just, yeah, really excited to be here and, and share. We did a version of this presentation, as, as Jeff said, at the intent event that Bombora pulled together in San Diego in the spring. Um, and the nice thing about looking out, you know, three, four years is that the themes have stayed consistent, but some of the details of how we execute now have, have been updated a little bit. So got about 40 minutes of content here. I've got 12 specific things I wanted to cover and talk about what those are going to look like by the end of 2026 and what we can do to prepare today. I'll try to keep track of the um, of the chat. We've got a couple of poll questions we'll get to as well, but, but we'll get right into it. Um, I think it's it can be a little dangerous sometimes to think about what the future looks like because we're almost always kind of wrong. I don't know if any of you remember the Jetsons um, and um, what, you know, what the, um, 
And when the Jetsons was on, if anyone can remember uh, when the Jetsons um, took place, does anyone know when the Jetsons took place in the future? The Jetsons took place um, in, uh, I think it was 19, assuming it came out in 1963, and it was intended to be a show uh, about 100 years later, so 2063. Um, which mean and, and in that show, Jeff, George Jetson was 40 years old. So does that mean he is George Jetson is alive as we do this webinar? Yeah, I, I believe so. I think somebody actually it was like they found his birthday, they did the math, and it was like George Jetson was born on this day, and it was only a couple of years ago. So yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 coming up, and so I, mean, I don't know that we're going to have flying saucers and jobs where we just push buttons. Maybe AI will get us there. It's amazing though, like when you think about like what people have tried to do over the years in terms of predicting what the future looks like. This is a painting that was done in like 1918, right? Like there 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 was barely radio. There was definitely not TV, so, and then maybe the flying car thing they didn't get right. But like they they envisioned us talking to each other on a phone essentially. Like the, so, this is actually pretty. This is pretty close. This one's less close. Um, what people in 1900 thought we would be doing a hundred a th hundred years later, walking on balloons to get across lakes, and then I don't know what that guy in the unicycle is doing. Um, but um, sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. I think is the point on this. And if you think about just what has happened in our lifetimes, if you think I was I I think a lot about like what my dad was a marketing and sales guy for Caterpillar Tractor and what marketing was for him and the things he did versus the things I do versus the things my kids are going to do. But this is Pascal Finette, and he does a lot of speaking and writing and talking about innovation. And he talks about the innovation curve and he says that the innovation in the past doesn't appear nearly as steep as it was. And the innovation we will face in the future appears today far steeper. It appears far steeper than it will be and that we will experience it. Because what we've seen in the past, we've become so used to. I mean, I think like if you would, if you would have gone 50 years ago and told people all the things you could do with a telephone, right? Not the telephone sticking on the wall that you had to rotary dial, but this this supercomputer that sits in all of our pockets now. It's just it's inconceivable the idea that you would have that. And so a lot of the innovations that we have today that we kind of take for granted no longer feels innovative. Things in the future appear scary because we can't wrap our heads around it yet. We're not used to it. One of the reasons why I think a lot of people are scared about AI, it's got a lot of angles to it, but some of the innovations to come, it's just really hard to even perceive. When I worked at Microsoft, uh, part of my job, I worked at the, um, the home of the future and they had this conceptual home and they had this, you walked into the home and as soon as you walked in and pressed a button, it knew who you were and it would turn on the music you liked and all this stuff that felt fanatic. It felt crazy, right? And the idea that like you could actually record shows and have all the shows, not on a DVD, but have them in a database somewhere just to call up on demand. Like I was, I'm old enough now, like when we did that, we're like, I mean, that seems cool, but that seems crazy that you could ever do that. Well, here we are. And you take for granted that you don't have to go find your DVD set of the Friends season three. You can just call it up on any device you want, whenever you want. Um, so I think that once, as we get into it, the future that we, that we create for ourselves, the future we experience, we'll feel more comfortable and we'll feel more normal. So I want to get into a few things that I think we're already seeing some, some trends on today, um, and, 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 uh, and share a little feedback on that. I think the first one is this idea of, of, of owned versus rented land. Um, the more com companies that are building out media uh, channels for themselves, building a direct audience. I mean, traditionally, advertising has been about sponsoring advertising in front of someone else's audience. And certainly you can still do that today. But we have democratized access to content channels. You still have to have something interesting to stay. You still have to have content that is attractive to your audience. But, but your ability to build your own podcast audience, your own video audience, your own uh, blog uh, followers, to create that owned land, opportunity is significant. Uh, we've seen this in the community space. The CMO Coffee Talk group that we worked with, uh, with Sixth Sense, got like 2,700 CMOs that will come every Friday to a Zoom call and hang out every day in a Slack community. Now that took a while to get up and rolling, but instead of having to go and spend money on someone else's access to CMOs, your opportunity is to sort of create that land for yourself. So I would highly encourage you if you're listening to this and thinking about, okay, I got to generate a media pipeline. Yes, generate pipeline for this quarter. But as you think about the future, as you think about building out an asset 
for your business, that own land needs to be part of your consideration set. It will subsidize the acquisition costs for your efforts moving forward. Two, I want to talk about sort of this data becoming more important um, than ever before. And maybe this is a good time to throw up sort of our first polling question around how you use intent signals uh, in your organization. Um, I think sometimes we think of intent signals, and, and I think the question we want to throw up here, if you wouldn't mind answering it for us, um, is, is how your organization uses intent signals today. I'd love to get a sense for if you're using them randomly, using them consistently, uh, wondering what the heck intent signals are, which we can answer here in a second. Um, Jeff, this seems like an area where a lot of companies aren't, if, if they're using intent signals, they're thinking of a fairly narrow, late stage buying process intent signal that they're leveraging. Yeah, it's it's really, so I had the privilege of being multiple time on board a customer before coming on. It's one of those rare things you get to do sometimes. And it's really interesting as I talk to marketers, as people are filling out this poll here, um, very often, right, it, we're starting, we're trying to answer question, right, great, I know who my total addressable market is, I know my relevant market, but who is in market, right? And that's where a lot of companies start with their intent signals. Uh, and so they're, they're, you know, how do I identify who's actually in market within my total market? And that's the promise. But what's really interesting is you talk with a lot of marketers, a lot of ABM teams as they get started and say, hey, we need to do smarter advertising or we need a better way to prioritize our SDR list. Um, but they're also what they're one thing that they are missing a lot of um, is the broader applications. Right. Are we getting in too late in the deal cycle? Right. When somebody's at a product evaluation, are we able to identify the research signals that happen further upstream? during that cycle. And then there's a lot of other really cool applications, things like, um, you know, actually in your existing customers, hey, what are they show? What are they researching in their businesses to, um, that we can cross sell them? Or, hey, they're researching a competitor. There might be a churn risk. So there's so many different applications, which is this fundamental data set um, as, as we go through here. Um, let's take a look at the poll results here. Yeah, pretty mixed. Um, I'm, I'm impressed with the number that are using it consistently today. That's pretty good. Um, yeah. And honestly, I think this is long, it, even though that's like 32%, it's only a third. Um, I, I think that's pretty advanced compared to a lot of marketers that we see in the market today. So lots of room for growth. And to just point, when I think of using intent signals, I think of throughout the buying journey. I think of what signals are you looking for that indicate a company is, ab is about to experience a problem that they do or don't know exists, right? early stage when you've got customers that are not actively buying and you've seen this movie before as an organization, you know your target audience well enough, you know what they're experiencing that that's going to lead to a level of pain and a level of discomfort and a level of need that will eventually lead to them needing to do something differently or buy a solution to solve for that. To be there early, to be the advisor, to be the counselor, to be the source of insight and credibility along the way increases your conversion rates and increases the velocity of those deals getting closed. So I think that my biggest message here is to really think sort of carefully about the um, the, uh, the 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 breadth of intent signals you can use and think about it from a partner ecosystem standpoint as well. We're going to talk about sort of partners here a couple of different other times in this presentation. But, you know, the intent signals don't just have to don't just come from your target customer. Who are they working with? Who are they partnered with? What signals are you seeing from them that could be an indicator that your target customer is interested or that the partner may be able to help you build leverage with that audience? And so. To me, this, Jeff, is this is the idea of saying, like, I got a thousand people I'm trying to target. Who should I be talking to today? You don't send a thousand direct mail pieces out this week. You send five out this week, four next week, eight the week after based on those signals. And that becomes a much better, more precise way of getting in front of the right people at the right time. Yeah, it's, it's one of the really there's a lot of different intent signals, right? At the end of the day, an intent signal is a comp what is a company doing research about? Right. That can be one or two people uh, looking up a particular keyword, right? That's contained in an article. That can be your first party intent of right people coming to your website. It's a pretty good indicator they're researching you, right? As as you go through that. But uh John made a good comment there, right? Those could be just tire kickers. How do I know that there's a statistically significant amount of more research happening um than normal, than just two people around a water cooler talking about the huskies? Uh, but then also where are they in that cycle? One of the fun things that that um 
that we've done with, with some of our clients, we actually do this thing called the historical buyer's journey analysis where we zero day out their, their close one times. And then you go backwards in time and you can actually see the research spikes definitively. And so I know, hey, these ones I want to hit with top of funnel demand creation campaigns and brand campaigns. And, oh, they're entering here. Now we're going to get more aggressive with kind of solution and BDR outreach and actually being able to tailor your engagement and tactics to where a prospect is in their research journey can be incredibly insightful for brands. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, knowing how and when to activate that, not just in your marketing, but also in your sales processes as well. Like, I mean, the, every salesperson I know from the beginning of time has, you know, just wants to know the answer to two questions. Who do I call next and what do I talk about? Right. And so they'll be able to say, like, here's who to call next based on this signal and to identify the weighting of those different signals for what they mean. If someone came to your last three webinars, that doesn't mean they're qualified. It might be they're bored. Right. I mean, so like, what are the signals that actually imply real intent, real need that you can follow up with and which 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 mean maybe a content or an email or marketing follow versus who needs actual phone call because they have a more acute need. All right. We're we're already way behind on time, Jeff. We got to keep going here because I got 12 and we're through two Um, ecosystems and relationships, I think, are going to be the currency of marketers and selling teams moving forward. Um, I think especially as we get greater and greater impact of AI. I mean, right now, you know, AI can write your email sequences. There's talk that AIs are going to be able to replace the BDRs in terms of sort of creating more voicemails and creating more outbounds. Well, making that faster and cheaper to produce that doesn't solve the problem for the buyer. It exacerbates the problem for the buyer because they're going to start to get more. And who do we listen to when we have more and more noise? We're trying to make sense of that. We're trying to find the people that we trust. Our partners, the people around us, those are going to increasingly be the people that we care about the most. Um, sometimes I think about this not just in terms of partners, but also sort of this is a this is a B two C model I pulled that I think is very relevant in B two B as B two C or B two B as well family, friends, colleagues, like I'm constantly asking people that I know, um, just, you know, in a variety of different circles for advice on things that they may not be the experts on, but I trust them to give me direction in, in terms of where to go. Um, it's so hard to go. And like, if I go to Amazon, and I look for something and it's got 25,000, you know, five-star reviews, like that sounds great, but that also sounds unrealistic. So the people around me, the other people, again, until robots sell the robots, I think it's people that we listen to. And increasingly, and as AI accelerates, it's going to be people that are even more important for us to listen to. Those, those ecosystems to leverage those is going to become crazy, crazy important. Um, demand and brand are going to be better balanced. We have over-rotated on demand campaigns as the coin of the realm for marketing teams. Yes, demand is important. Yes, pipeline is important. But if all you do is generate tomorrow's leads and tomorrow's pipeline, you're going to pay a tax forever on having to generate that pipeline versus building some brand for your business as well. One of my favorite examples of this is something that Smartsheet has done, not just because of the way they've done it, but because of where they came as a business. Smartsheet started as a very PLG, product-led growth-driven business. All of their marketing was focused on how many free trials did we get. And as they've expanded into enterprise, they've created a lot more diversity and sophistication in terms of the way they think about marketing. So they knew that they needed to um, build more brand awareness, especially outside of the U.S. market. And so they chose McLaren and Formula One to do that. And what they did is instead of putting Smartsheet on all the cars, they went, and you can see like in here, you can see Smartsheet underneath where it says Chrome. Here, underneath where it says Android, it says Deadly Science. Well, what is Deadly Science? So... When they did the Australian Grand Prix, they went and partnered with this company called Deadly Science. Deadly Science is a nonprofit in Australia that is that, that promotes uh, STEM uh, education, science, reading, math uh, with Aboriginal uh, communities. And so it's this phenomenal nonprofit that got awareness for themselves. Smartsheet gets value for promoting them. Everyone gets value. Now, uh, did, did they measure this on pipeline? A hundred percent. They looked at that, right? Like a friend of mine is actually the enterprise a VP of enterprise sales there and like taking prospects and customers at the paddock club, wanting and dining and doing the field activation. Obviously they're seeing an impact there, but the CMO, the CMO at Smartsheet was very specific in saying like, we will not justify this effort on pipeline. We are doing this to improve our brand. So we are in the consideration set. 
more often in the markets where we are prioritizing this. That is a, that is a brand program that is driving demand impact and an overall halo impact for the organization overall. Now, and I'm assuming not everyone sitting and watching this webinar today has the budget to sponsor Formula One racing, but I think this the 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 message here is that we have to balance those brand of demand efforts moving forward. And I expect in 2026 we're going to see mature companies do a lot more of that. Um, buying committees are getting way more complicated. We've certainly seen over the last year plus, um, as we're in this little shadow recession that the feds don't want to talk about, but it's, you know, uh, the, the, the layoff news and the, uh, the, the, the results from a lot of startup companies certainly implies otherwise, you know, there's a lot more people at the table. Um, you know, the, there's, we've have this buying committee we've always thought of as these different members that are sitting around the table. Well, now many of them are working from home, working remotely, not sitting around the table. And Gartner does such a phenomenal job of making things seem incredibly sophisticated and complicated here. They've kind of done all these different sort of pushes of where things are going. So not only is the buying committee getting larger, but the nature of how people make decisions is changing. This is this is old data, and so it's currently it, I bet it's gone even farther this direction in the it, since 2017. As we get more millennials, is part of the buying process. Millennial and Gen Z buyers are becoming more important parts of the buying process. What do they care about? At the bottom of this list is product features. At the top, company community involvement and company values. And so you've got buyers not just deciding based on who's got the most features and not just based on the business results of what you're going to deliver for them. How are you addressing your prospects need to know who you are as a business? What are your values? What do you stand for? What impact are you having in the community? What's your purpose? What are you doing philanthropically? I mean, this is where people want to identify with companies that they believe in. Brent Adamson does a fantastic job talking about how we make decisions, not just based on what we need for the business, but based on our identity. What does this purchase decision, what is aligning with your company say about me? This data here is telling me that that is something that you've got these younger buyers that are becoming more and more important parts of the buying process to care about. Last thing I'll say before we move on on this one is when you get through the buying committee, you end up with a customer. Now you've got a user committee and there aren't nearly enough companies thinking about that user committee. You've got people that weren't involved in the buying process now using the product. You've got people that were actively involved in the buying process that have moved on to other priorities and no longer involved in that. And so how are you addressing those members of the user committee? How are you addressing those members that turn over and go somewhere else? How are you staying in touch with the executive sponsors um, so that you can so that you can continue to reinforce the why and communicate and validate that the product and the after the outfit the outcome is working. I also think we're going to see a continued focus on not just well executed channels, but integrating channels together. Um, this is this is hard to do for small companies and really complicated for larger companies. So I think we're going to see more of a focus though and more of an intention and, and importance around creating this unified experience for customers all around us. They're not saying, well, here's a message I get from email and here's a message I get from retail and here's a message I get when I go to a trade show. If it's disjointed, then you're not creating velocity and momentum in that relationship. And this is more than just saying we want to be an integrated program. I think this is also marketers starting to address and adopt work management systems. The most effective companies doing, making this move to an omni-channel approach, not just thinking about stages of the funnel, but thinking about the flywheel of surrounding the customers are the same companies that are adopting tools like Workfront and Asana and Monday.com to make it easy to activate the intention of being an integrated marketer. It's so, so important and hard for a lot of companies to do. Um, we're clearly going to see a lot more automation. I do not believe marketing jobs are going away. My dad, I remember once when I asked my dad, I said, like, I can't imagine doing my job as a marketer without a computer, yet you were doing marketing in the 60s and 70s for uh, for Caterpillar. Like, how the heck did you do that? He said, I was doing the same things, just different. Like when I would come home with a stack of paper, that was my inbox. I didn't have email. I had these papers that I had to read. And some of them were memos. And some of them I had to write things back and put it in an envelope and send it back to them. Um, I had ad copy, but I didn't have rev marks. I had a red pen. So a lot. So you think about what did marketing look like in the 60s and 70s versus what it looked like in 2000 versus what it looks like today, separate the idea of tasks and jobs. 
right? The job of marketing is not going anywhere. The tasks in marketing, thankfully, continue to evolve and we continue to see more and more of that being automated. There's so much, so many things that I'm really glad I don't have to do. I don't have to pay people to do. I don't have to have any humans do that robots can do for me so I can have the humans, the craftsmen, the tradesmen, and men, women do that smart, do that more, more important marketing work. I'd love, I think we got another poll here. I'd love to get a sense, Jeff, for sort of what this community is doing with AI today. Like, are you using AI? Is it sort of a individual process? Um, do you have a team strategy around who's using AI? Um, look forward to seeing what people think here. Yeah, definitely curious as people are punching that in. I know like we've had some of our BDRs tinkering with fun tools like Lavender, and we're actually going through a, an education process um, right now with, with some of our content and campaign people, we're actually going through and testing and there's actually homework. Shalane's one of the people in that process uh, to, to really kind of facilitate that learning. Because one thing, you know, if you don't make time for it, you're not going to get to it unless it's an area you really want to geek out in. So it's definitely something I highly recommend everybody should do. But um, as we get these answers in here, I'm curious to see what this group is. And throw in the chat, yeah. what tools have you been using? What tools have you tinkered with? There's so many fun tools out there. I, and I think that the best way to get comfortable with AI is just to sort of download the tools and sort of A, start using it and B, assume it can do everything. I mean, yeah. I mean, think about all the tactical stuff that you do. I mean, like, I, I think that, you know, if if you're, if you're not, if you haven't read uh, Bird for Bird by Anne Lamont, such a great book about writing, and she talks about the shitty first draft, like the hardest part of writing sometimes is creating that first draft. Well, like with AI, writer's block is extinct now, I think, right? Because like, you can have AI write that shitty first draft for you. And, and let's be clear, like most AI writing today, it's about C minus material. Like it's not, it looks like right. a robot wrote it. We still need artists. We still need copywriters to craft that into something better. Right. But I think about all that time that goes into in, in, in the pain of, of creating that, that shitty first draft from copywriters, if they no longer had to do that and could focus on the polish, focus on the editing, oh my God, you got happier copywriters with better output. Exactly. This is what I expected to see, Jeff. Is yeah. and I think this is where we are today, um, where you've got an awful lot of people that are starting to dabble with it themselves, but there isn't sort of a corporate strategy for this yet. Uh, I, I think yeah. we're still. I, I mean, AI is going to surpass the internet in terms of its its impact on I think business and society in general. But we're certainly still. I mean, do you, I, some people on Muzz Call might be old enough to remember when the internet wasn't websites; it was like Gopher. Right. Remember the University of Minnesota had Gopher and it wasn't it was like files. Right. You just went it were pages yep. of files. That's what it was. And then you had like traffic cones saying like, oh, under construction, like that's kind of where we are. <laughs> and I think things will evolve to the point where we eventually have a better strategy than we do today. Um, I would just encourage <laughs> Melinda. Yeah, I look, I, I big fan of Gopher in the 90s. Boy, when I was in school anyway, um, go Gophers. So the the yeah, so I I think that. I would encourage everyone like uh, suspend your fear for a moment around what AI is and what it could be. Right. Yeah. Let's assume that the robots aren't going to take over and try to murder us. Let's assume for a moment that you will continue to be able to pay your mortgage. Like when I talk to people about, you know, AI and what they're thinking, like I, I, I hear a lot of existential fear. You are going to have a job. It will look different than it did today in a three or four years, just the way that it's different than it was 10 years ago. When I was an intern at a PR firm, I remember part of my job was building briefing books for uh, press tours, right? Like AI can do that for us. No one should ever have to do that again. Put those interns to work doing better work, right? So there's a huge opportunity. And if we look at that way, I think that's where we're going to see continued innovation uh, and better use of the unique skills that humans bring to the table. We have a client in the uh, chemical real sales space that has an entire addressable market of about 142 companies. When you are selling to 142 large companies, you're not as worried about demand generation as you are sales enablement. And I think we're going to see more companies move in that direction, where especially as you build owned land, as you build a community, as you think of your business as a media company, and you get more people that are coming to you for content, driving demand becomes less important than using those intense signals to activate your sales team. I literally had a call with a company this morning that has made huge strides in their ability to drive integrated marketing programs. The next step is the sales enablement, sales integration component to make sure that that continuity of story and message and buying journey continues through the sales process, through the customer success, onboarding and account management. 
And so the more we think about that sequence, the more we're going to invest in the efforts that drive that forward. And I think that that broader thinking of the impact of marketing, not just on building pipeline, but managing that whole process and not just through to the sale, also into the customer success side as well. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, more and more companies, I think, Jeff, that are going to be start using sort of work management systems. I think those are going to be built based on this need for centers of excellence as the mar as the as the scope of marketing increases. And as you have more and more people touching different parts of the customer journey, not just from a demand standpoint, from a sales enablement standpoint, from a customer success standpoint, as your company grows and you have centralized brand message positioning campaign strategy work that needs to get executed in the field where localization of a mar of a campaign is going to drive different levels of execution, but that have some levels of similarity and consistency in terms of how it's executed, how it's tracked. It's going to be more and more important that we create those centers of excellence and that we really think through not just what the campaign is, but what this work management program is. The model on the left is what we've seen a lot of companies do in the past where they've had a centralized group as the is sort of a hub and spoke um, kind of a component. That's not going to work moving forward. The increased complexity of the way we do marketing is require a decentralized version where all those different spokes talk to each other. You have to have a centralized system of work management to make that happen. And we're going to see a lot more of that moving forward as well. I think we're going to see a number of new roles uh, emerge that we don't have today. I, you know, I think ABM wasn't a thing 10 years ago. And then we see ABM marketing managers. I'm seeing less and less companies hire people with ABM in the title, not because ABM is going away, because ABM is just part of how we do work now. Same way that we used to have this frothiness around social selling. You don't hear social selling used as a phrase much anymore because now it's just a better way of doing selling. I do think there are some roles moving forward. I think when we did this presentation in the spring, like we're going to have prompt engineers, we're going to have people doing prompt engineering. I think this is going to go the way of the ABM, uh, the ABM role now, where everyone is going to be expected to get really good at asking the right questions and making the right adjustments to what AI outputs for us. I think that's going to be table stakes. I do think our focus on ecosystems and partner programs is going to create the need for partner ecosystem managers. And this is going to be just as important as the demand side. So you're going to have people that are driving direct demand in your, organi in your organization, in your pipeline. You're going to have people with sales or excuse me, with ecosystem and partner quotas from a demand and pipeline standpoint. It's not just the sales programs now. It's co-marketing across the entire ecosystem and the entire buying journey and not just one company working with another but you think about that graphic we had before that showed all the different people that are influencing your customers we are going to be able to execute on that level of effect of a, of comp of complexity with the help of ai with the help of systems with the help of work management programs i think that's going to become a bigger and bigger problem part of where we're going moving forward i also jeff think the bdr role is going to change significantly i i you know i think we're going to have a more nuanced person doing this that seems more like an AE than the BDR we think of today that is able to have a more value-added conversation that's going to take those insights, those intent signals, and everything we know historically about a customer. AI is going to make it so that you give that person immediately the insights and conversation and prompts they need to have a more sophisticated conversation up front, not making 100 calls a day to set a bunch of appointments, making a smaller number of the right calls with a higher conversion rate into next steps because it was the right call at the right time with the right level of conversation. Yeah, we're already seeing this, right? With the, most of my team is doing it, right? With Lavender, right? Already tailing, hey, these are things you want to talk about. You can inform that. And we have uh, one of our customers, Accenture, uh, uses this, right? For uh, looking at, they call it key account intelligence. What should I talk to this customer about? But if you're not, if your sales reps aren't using tools like Chat GPT or whatnot, just even analyze a, a 10K um, or summarize an earnings report, right? Those things that normally took a long time, like they can do in seconds. And so as you start to see these things, to your point, we're at the under construction construction stage, but you can already start to see people are dabbling and in, in connecting those dots. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm going to keep moving here because uh, I want to make sure we get through everything and I'm keeping an eye on as well. Shalane, like we got one more survey we're going to do here in a second. Um, boy, we see so much focus on acquisition. We're starting to see more, a more sophisticated way of customers, people thinking about customer marketing. Um, this is not a line. This is how sometimes people, you've seen people say, oh, you go from left to right and you make your way through the customer journey. Well, this implies that it ends somewhere over here, right? And it's really just a loop. You think about, um, you know, how many customers you work with, like in the way we think about repeat customers ourselves as a business, we've been doing our thing for 15 years. 
when we think about repeat customers, we all think of, also think about repeat executive sponsors, someone that worked for you, hired you, and is now working for their third or fourth company since they worked with you and now are bringing you back. Is that a repeat customer from an account standpoint? No, but it's still people selling to people. So that person knows and trusts you and they bring you in again in a new company that counts as well. So we have to think about this as a loop. I don't even think like some companies talk about this as a bow tie. A bow tie implies an end as well. You have to think about this as an infinite loop of relationships you're building, relationships with the account, relationships with the individuals, relationships with you. And the history of that relationship matters. You know, if like think about when Salesforce, if you have someone who's the CMO at one company and they move to another company, the easiest thing to do is create a new account and a new and, and a new contact. And then all of a sudden you've got three or four contacts from their past jobs still in Salesforce. If you delete the old ones, you lose the history. You lose all the history of what they have done with you and what their interests are and what they've been attracted to in the past. And as we add more insights, it's going to become more and more important to have that continuity of story, to have those years, if not decades of experience with that customer to guide what they should see next, to guide what they want to hear about next. The tools we have are going to help with this. The intense signals increasingly democratized and available to us will help. AI is going to accelerate this as well. It's actually going to be pretty exciting. And the last thing before we get to Q&A um, is that the fundamentals are going to matter more than ever before. I think just because we have tools, just because technology is becoming the coin of the realm, I think, you know, that we're seeing companies decrease their reliance on media spend, decrease their reliance on digital and paid channels and increase the amount of time and effort they spend on tools and technology. The information we have and the insights we have and how we activate those and act on those is, is really the coin of the realm. And so I think your understanding of your target market your understanding of the people that are buying within that target or that within those accounts, what to say to them at different stages of the process, how the sales process works that is based on how people buy, not based on how you want to sell. Like all of the innovation and tools we're talking about support this program. And so I'm curious in our last slide, how would you rate your team's mastery to be of these fundamentals? I mean, you know, how how much are you thinking about? And again, like I think, Jeff, some of this stuff on this list, I think of is sort of product marketing fundamentals, right? Yeah. Like who are we selling to? What is our target market? What's the subset of the subset of our target market that is our real um, audience? And how well do we know them and can talk to speak their language? Yeah, no, I, I, and what's the journey they need to go on, right? As, as you go through that, right? That sales cycle, et cetera. As people are, are punching in kind of their answers to this, I mean, Right. The, there's just so many getting back to those fundamentals and thinking through it. And even as I was glancing at the sales cycle, there's a whole nother conversation that we could have at some point on just like uh, Matt Dixon's latest research and the jolt effect and things like that. It's like the sales cycles in human psychology is adapted a little bit or we're learning more about it of like there are different things you need to be thinking about. How do you build an internal champion kit? Or how do you get them so that they can advocate? How do you de-risk the situation for your prospects so that they're not worried about messing up, um, right? And go, just going through all those different things. How's your messaging change for that? So, so much goodness in here, even just getting back to some of those those fundamentals. Uh, love to see what we got here uh, for answers on this and kind of see where we are in the continuum. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds yep. about right, and and I think that you know we we have a um we have a maturity model that we'll go we'll go through with 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 our clients to say okay in these different areas good better best where are you and no one is ever all the way to the immature side on these things no one is ever all the way to the forward thinking like if you are if you are if you are the best of the best today that deteriorates over time today's innovation is tomorrow's broken status quo and so if you built your icp 3 4 years ago if you built your content strategy 3 4 years ago if you built your sales and marketing innovation program 1 to 2 years ago those things need to be revisited on a regular basis those become fundamental foundational elements of your programs um so i know we're going to get to some q and a here jeff um uh, you know, this is one of those things where I'll be curious. I, I, I kind of like the idea of sort of having this kind of a presentation and every year sort of moving the ball, moving the goalpost for, back a little forward. Um, like if we said, okay, what is this look like in 2028? Um, you know, the further out we get, the harder it is to predict. But I think as we see the world evolve, as we see the tools and technology evolve, as that impacts the way people buy, which will impact the way we sell, uh, lots will change. So it'll be kind of fun to watch that. Um, but um, we'd be happy to sort of answer some questions. And we had a couple coming in already. Yep. So 
uh, look forward to uh, to hearing what y'all have to think. Awesome. All right. Well, don't don't be shy at dropping your questions in chat or in the Q and A box. There, I've got a couple that have come in here as we go through that. Um, if we wanted to start prepping on two to three of these trends, which ones would you pick to focus on? Well, um, I mean, I think the fundamentals are important, right? I would certainly sort of, you know, go back and just take an honest view of like, you know, how well have we defined our ICP? Um, is it documented and agreed to by all? Um, those things I think are really, really important. Um, I, and I think the, the clock is ticking on um, the owned versus rented land as well. You know, I think it's, it's not that the opportunity is going to go away for you. It's just that the sooner you start, the sooner you can benefit from it. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's, to me, it's not just saying, oh, let's get people to come to a webinar like this. It's having a consistent platform that people are paying attention to. That could be a community. It could be a media channel. Like I look at what, you know, and I look at, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the tech space, you know, media channels getting bought by tech companies, like outreach, spending a lot of money to buy sales hacker. Um, yeah. you know, I think, you know, partner hacker gets bought by reveal, so you've got these organizations that value that and say like, well, I don't want to build it. I'll just go to buy what someone else had, right? I think we're going to see some more of that, but I think we're going to see more companies start to invest in that community and that relationship. I'm seeing that in a variety of different markets uh, in industries already. This one kind of piles onto that last one you hit on briefly, which was ICP. What What's the cadence we should look at ICP at? Oh, I think at least every year. Um, I think, you know, maybe moving forward a little more frequently than that. I think, you know, the... I would recommend that you, you know, as you develop your ICP, you stress test that against your pipeline data. So if you say, okay, we need to be selling into certain markets and certain industries with certain filters, make sure that your conversion rates and your velocity rates in those markets are commensurate with your focus on it. And know that, you know, when you when we say ICP, most of the time, what that means is, is like a difference between proactive and reactive. Like when I think of like, you know, who you want to sell to, I think of proactive, reactive and no fly zone, right? Proactive means here's the named accounts that I think are my best prospects that I want to go and sell to. And they maybe reach meet all of six pieces of criteria you have. Well, someone comes inbound, they've got three or four, but they're highly motivated. As long as you didn't have to go buy, you know, go spend the money to acquire them somewhere else, they came to you. That's reactive. You're happy to sell to them. Someone else is nowhere near your ICP, like don't spend time with them, right? Like yeah. is not every lead is a good lead. <laughs> and so I think like revisiting that who's in the proactive versus reactive based on what you're seeing in the market, what you're seeing in your pipeline, what your conversion rates look like, um, that can be done depending on your sales cycle length and the speed of innovation in your market, you know, as much as every quarter, I'd say for most companies, once or twice a year at most. Nice. How do you see the evolution of privacy laws impacting marketing in the next few years? <laughs> Um, another reason why own land is going to become more and more important, right? I mean, I think, you know, the, you know, who knows whether or not Google eventually, you know, does get rid of the cookie, but we're certainly going to see sort of privacy restrictions, um, opt outs become more, more of an issue. Uh, I think AI is going to increase the amount of, um, intimacy we, that, that companies have in terms of the knowledge that is created, the knowledge that is collected, the, what's known about you. I think that's going to create more of a pushback from consumers and watchdog groups to create more protection there. Um, I mean, look, I mean, I don't know how old the book Permission Marketing is that Seth Godin wrote, like, but like back to the idea that like, do you have permission to not just send someone an email, but do you have permission in their brains? Like, do you, have you done enough to earn attention? Do people yeah. want to spend time with you? Are you interruptive or are you irresistible? And if you're doing marketing well, if you're earning the attention of your target audience, those, those privacy restrictions end up not being a barrier for your marketing. They end up being a, a competitive differentiator because you have the mind, the hearts and minds of that customer and don't have to worry about where you're being restricted. Yeah, no, definitely good ones on, on that. Dan from Siemens um, with the intent of it, talked about the, the all wanted email, right? A thing that uh, that was highly, highly desired there. Um, all right, we've got a couple more minutes here. What are some of the fundamental bases to cover regarding measuring marketing ROI today? You can't get through any webinar without talking about it. <laughs> I need um, that one. Yeah, I... I I think it's really important to to 
there's the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And I, and I just, I think the complexity of the way that we have to do sales and marketing today continues to outpace our ability to measure it all. And so if you go and try to measure everything, I think that's just going to be really, really difficult. Um, I think if you go in knowing what you're trying to achieve and measuring that job, um, like I think about Smartsheet, right? Like they want to build awareness in markets. Well, they can measure awareness but they also wanted to, part of that was being part of the consideration set. So how many RFPs are they named in as a finalist from the beginning? How many RFPs are they being asked to participate in now versus before? Is that 100% because they sent people to the paddock club? Probably not, right? But like there's a cause and effect there that I think is an important way to look at. And like, I know like, you know, there's like, there's lots, I think the more sophisticated our systems get, the more sophisticated our data models get the more you're going to see people say, we got to go deep and do regression analysis and figure all this stuff out. I hope that works. I've been doing this a long time. It hasn't worked yet. And it's just created a lot of frustration and stress from a lot of well-meaning people. Um, so I think this is at the end of the day, like don't Google isn't going to tell you what to do. Your customer is just listen to the customer, spend time listening to them, spend time understanding what they care about and follow accordingly. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more on that. I know it is tricky. It's the thing we all face though, right? That constant pressure, what's working, what drove it? Well, it's like six things and multiple touches and uh, right. Building the relationship. A um, couple good intent question ones here came in, in the, in the chat. How do you get started with intent data for companies who are operating in a specific niche? Does it work for niche markets? Um, yeah. Really good question on, on that one. Um, it, short answer. It, it always depends, right. Mm -hmm. as, as you go through that, but um, it, it should work for pretty much most markets as, as you go through that. The big thing is where are your buyers doing their research and is that detectable by the intent tools that are out there, right? As, as you go through that, happy to talk on that one's probably a good one to handle uh, offline one on one. We could chat on that a little bit more um, as you go through that, but it can do everything from, um, you know, very, very niche tailored markets, both geo and, and kind of industry categories um, to very broad. So uh, it just kind of depends unique to your use case there. So what's the right answer? Another good one came in here on um, the value. How do you prove or determine the value of intent data? Um, looks like you've got a couple different sources here. Forrester and Gartner typically say most companies have two to three sources of intent data, first party, third party, review sites, those kinds of things. Um, but it's difficult to tell if it's impactful. Um, so when I was a multiple time customer, one of the ways I always started with this, and now we've gotten more sophisticated, was on efficiency and velocity. Because theoretically, I'm spending my dollars and my time in a better spot, um, right? Like I should see an increase in my conversion rates. I should see a hopefully a decrease in my sales cycle, um, right? There are different things as you measure. Ideally, my win rate should go up, right? We got better targeting. We're spending our time on the leads that are in market. Right. So having some level of benchmark as you go through that, what's been fun is um, we, we have a, a partner we do a lot of work with. Um, and what we're actually seeing statistically proven out is when you're using intentative on board as intent is what we're looking at with these ones is we're seeing increase in pipeline velocity, a measurable increase. I won't say the win rates don't always go up, but deal sizes typically do. It's actually kind of interesting as they've dialed in, it varies account to account what they've got going on there. But we're actually seeing substantially versus like, hey, we're picking out in the ether, accounts not showing intent, substantial increases in the overall pipeline velocity. And that's right, measured by basically dollars per day that you're making per opportunity as, as you go through that. Um, so baseline one is kind of get your benchmarks in place and measure efficiency gained against that. And then there are tools and things like that. And, and happy, Melinda, to talk with you on, on that one-on-one um, -on -one kind of to your particular situation. Matt, what are your thoughts, though, on that? How, do you, how have you seen people determine the value of intent data? Well, I mean, there's there's some clear A-B testing you can do around that, right? Like if yeah. you send out 100 postcards just to everybody versus, you know, sort of sequence them out with a more unique message at the right time. Um, I think what, what you got to be careful with, though, is not just measuring the response rate, but the overall time and effort. It can become it can be a lot easier just to send everything at once. It can take more time and effort and cost more to right. customize it. But I think, you know, you, a lot of companies get penny wise and pound foolish when they say, well, I need the most leads at the low possible, lowest possible cost. No, you don't. You need the best leads at an acceptable cost. 
right? Yeah. I want the right people from the right companies engaging me in sort of something that resembles the part of a buying journey. And I want to do that in a unit economics that makes it so that I can still be create profitable relationships with these customers. And as long as I can do that at and below the customer acquisition cost that I'm willing to accept, I'll do that all day long. And it may be higher on a cost per lead basis than what I'm used to getting by generating any lead I want, any lead that I can get a, that is a that is fogging up a mirror. So I think there's a little bit of a different way you got to think about like the 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 denominator there. Um, to create the right sort of economic model to show what's working. But I, I think that's that different paradigm of thinking about how to value the intent data and how to measure what's working will get you to the right place. And another interesting way one of our clients has done it, um, <laughs> they basically measured opportunities and accounts they would not have known about without intent data, um, mm -hmm. right? They were not on a list or something, or they engaged them because they saw that. Um, it's a big public picture company. And, uh, I can't, unfortunately, I can't share the, uh, the number, but it's in the tens of millions of dollars. They have closed one by identifying ops that didn't exist and things like that. So it all depends on kind of what matters to your business. How are you metric? You know, how are you looking at that? But there are ways in which you can take a look at, at that. So Melinda, happy to engage on that. We have time for one more, Matt. Sure. Uh, I see. Uh, it looks like John might drop uh, one in here as well. <laughs> a age old question. I feel like I hear about this at every marketing conference I go to. What's the best way to align sales, business development, and marketing? Uh, do we have another hour for this? I know, right? Um, this is therapy at this point. Yeah, this this is yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you got to align not just focus and accountability but you got to align compensation behind what matters, right? I mean, I think, you know, you you got to focus on metrics you can buy a beer with. And not everyone is going to be there when the deal gets signed, but everyone needs to be focused and measured and valued and rewarded based on those deals getting signed. Like revenue events is the most important part of this. And it's important to know that in a, in a complex deal cycle, it's never one campaign. It's never one download. It's never one salesperson that drove the deal. It's a body of work across a lot of people. And so I guess I, I, there's a lot of ways to answer this question. I, I, I think politics gets in the way a lot. I think ego gets in the way a lot. I think who gets credit gets in the way a lot. Yeah. And if you can eliminate those from the conversation, which is way easier said than done. <laughs> but if you can take away the need to figure out who gets credit and just convince, just believe that this is a team sport that everyone's going to have a different job to do, then I think you can create a lot better integration, a lot better sharing, a lot better collaboration across those different teams. Awesome. All right. I think we got through most of them here. If we didn't, we'll, we'll follow up offline um, with you as, as you go through that. But um Thank you, Matt. Hopefully you all learned as much again going through this as I did um, going through that. It's always fun. Uh, so uh, look forward to hopefully maybe having you back on again in the future. But yeah, keep these trends top of mind. Uh, you saw Matt's contact info at the end there. If you've got follow-up questions for him, we will share the recording. We will share the, the slides out uh, from this for those who attended. So thank you all. Uh, and hopefully you have a great rest of your week and stay dry for those impacted by uh, major storms on either coast. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you later. Thanks,